All right, joining me for this episode is my longtime good friend, Brad Penniston, the deputy editor of Defense One. Brad and I both worked at military.com in the early days, but not at the same time. Brad was one of the original writing team at military.com. Those were the days when the Pentagon Press Corps or the Pentagon PAOs had no idea what to do with the organization that didn't have a print arm. Yeah, I think we were actually the first to get uh, a press pass for an all digital organization. They they really didn't quite believe that somebody who didn't print on paper was a was a legit news organization. And we also share the same stable, the book over your left shoulder we'll talk about today, No Higher Honor, which is about the mine hitting the Samuel B. Roberts and the other associated stories. So I asked Brad to join us for this this episode to go deep on what happened before and after and in great detail what happened during Operation Praying Mantis. So let's set the scene, Brad. My viewers have heard about the United States' relationship with Iran primarily through the prism of the F-14 sale to Iran. I've done two episodes about the Iranian F-14s. So let's just review the bidding real quick. The Shah of Iran asked President Nixon for airplanes to keep up with the Iraq threat and the Soviet threat, actually. Um, and so Nixon basically said, whatever you want. They did a fly off at Andrews Air Force Base between the Tomcat and the Eagle. The Shah liked the Tomcat, so he wound up getting 79 of the 80 that they ordered. Uh, in the middle of that uh, delivery, the Shah was deposed by the Ayatollah Khomeini and the Iranian revolution began. They took a number of Americans hostage and held them for 444 days at the embassy in Tehran. And the other thing that happened at that time is Iraq invaded Iran. One facet of that war that we don't pay enough attention to is the tanker war. So let's talk about Operation Earnest Will. As you mentioned, uh, Iraq invaded Iran. Iran retaliated within a couple of years. Uh, the fighting had ground down to you know, trench warfare, basically a stalemate, although there was also a rather horrific war of the cities where each side lobbed missiles at each other's uh, civilian neighborhoods. Um, but around 1982, Iraq uh, hit on a new stratagem, which was to go after Iran's economic jugular, the, uh, the, the tankers that carried Iranian oil and petroleum products you know, out of the Gulf and, and to the wider world. Um, there was also some suspicion that uh, Saddam Hussein had an even more Machiavellian take on this, which was that he wanted Western help to end this war that he had started. And he thought that by disrupting the world's oil supplies, he could get uh, the United States and other people involved to to bring it to a halt. Um, that didn't work out quite the way he, he thought it did. But the tanker war ensued. So year after year, 82, 83, 84, 85, uh, Iraq and then Iran began attacking ships in the Gulf, ostensibly the ships that were helping out you know, their enemy, but you know, in practice, uh, anybody who was, a, who was an available target. So around about 1987, Kuwait got sick of this and they went to the mounted diplomatic effort uh, along two axes. The first was to Washington and they said, hey, I know that the U.S. Navy isn't really keen on protecting third-party ships, but what if we take some of our tankers and we reflag them under U.S. flag? And uh, Washington kind of said, Arr. so at the same time, other Kuwaitis went to Moscow and basically said the same thing. And Moscow said, yeah, we can throw a couple ships your way, at which point Washington said, yeah, did we say no? We meant yes. <laughs> so uh, this was the beginning of, as you said, Operation Earnest Will. It was a convoy operation. Uh, it started in mid-1987, and it involved um, something like sixfold the number of U.S. warships operating in the Persian Gulf region. They did some crazy stuff with this reflagging. They would actually like paint new names on the stern and, and that sort of give them new home ports. And we had one ship in particular that, that hit a mine and... Uh, Fortunately, the same naval architect design that keeps oil from spilling out uh, saved this ship. But but that was sort of a uh, a heads up or a warning uh, to the United States of this threat. And in turn, we went to the Iranians and said, you know, if you do this again, uh, we're going to take military action. 
So let's fast forward to 14th of April, 1988. There was at that time a frigate by the name of Samuel B. Roberts that had joined the Ernest Will operation. And the Roberts was, you know, it was an Oliver Hazard uh, Perry class frigate, but it was unlike most of the other frigates that had come before in that its crew was really really well trained. Uh, it was led by a guy named uh, Paul Wren, Commander Paul Wren. And Wren was an interesting guy. He had been in the Riverine Navy in, in you know, Southeastern Asia. He had you know, come up through the surface warfare ranks, and this was his first command. And the Samuel B. Roberts was, uh, was a brand new ship. And uh, so Wren gathered his plank owners together, and he said, look, this is not going to be some random ship in the Navy. This is going to be the best ship in the Navy. We are going to be the New York Yankees. Nobody is going to be better than us. And he said, this starts with uh, the idea that every sailor who, who serves aboard the Roberts, I want them to think that there was nothing better that they could have done with their lives for those you know, two, three, four years than serve aboard this frigate. Uh, and he said another thing too, which is kind of unusual. Um, he really believed in the power of heritage to uh, to motivate a crew. And so he said, all right, so what's our ship's name? It's Samuel B. Roberts. Well, who was that? He was a Navy coxswain who, during the Battle of Guadalcanal, uh, sacrificed himself to save the Marines coming off the beach. He steered his 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 whale boat back and forth along the beach where Marines were were fleeing from from the Japanese and uh, uh, and, and distracted them long enough to, to get them off the beach. He did not survive the encounter. He was given the Navy cross, and, and soon enough, the Navy named a ship after him. Um, and not just any ship. This was the Samuel B. Roberts DE-413, which was a hero of the Battle off Samar, where a bunch of small boys essentially faced off uh, a, a Japanese battleship force. So, you know, Coming then on to uh, the 1980s ship, the Roberts, and Rin said, look, we've got big shoes to fill, but we're going to fill them, you know, serve with pride. We're the Samuel B. Roberts. They deployed to the Persian Gulf, again, their very first deployment, and uh, they arrived in February 1988. So you said, uh, let's let's bring it up to 14 April 88. Well, this was, this was when the Roberts was coming back from escorting uh, a tanker had dropped it off at Kuwait and it was coming back uh, west east back to the mouth of the Gulf. When the lookout on the forecastle said, I see something. And the OOD said, okay, I'll stop. And they got out the big eyes and they looked and there were a trio of floating mines in front of them. The thing about floating mines is if you do it right, you can't see them uh, because these were mines to uh, uh, a design actually made in 1908 for the Russian Tsarist Navy. And it consisted of a weight on the bottom a length of chain and the 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 round you know classic picture of a mine that you would see in any cartoon sphere with with little horns on it and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to make that length of chain just sufficient to not break the surface so whoever laid these mines hadn't done quite a good enough job of it uh, they should have been hidden they weren't but they only saw three of them probably there were more so OOD calls up Captain Rin Rin runs up to the bridge and he says okay this is what we're gonna do we're going to back out. You know, we got in here. We're going to see if we can back out the wake. But a frigate is not really meant to back straight. It's like throwing a paper airplane backwards, you know, just not not built to do it. And so um, they start up the uh, the APUs, the little electric powered, uh, you know, sort of nacelles on the side of the thing, and they start backing up. And they get maybe 15 minutes. Everybody thinks maybe they're going to get out of there. Uh, the skipper, by the way, has brought everybody up from the lowest level of the ship just as a precaution. And then, bam, a uh, huge explosion. They've hit a mine. It turns a truck size hole amidships. It breaks the, the ship's keel, puts a big hole in the engine room. That fills immediately, knocks the power offline. Another huge space is filled, and, and they got you know more flooding besides. So they're on fire. They're flooding. Uh, they're in the middle of a minefield, you know, with with hostels all around them. Uh, just a bad, bad situation. So we have some sound of Commander Wren on the ship's intercom, the 1MC, briefing the crew on the status after they kind of get the damage control situation under control. And you can hear uh, how he exudes leadership to your point. This guy's, uh, you know, one of those great leaders that uh, the Navy is blessed by sometimes. So let's take a listen to that, that, uh, that audio. The flooding is being pumped out at AMR 3. We found a hole in AMR 2. The engineers have shorted up. 
The aggressive flooding has been controlled, and we are riding the ship again. Keep your heads up. We're doing a good job. Help is on the way. There are two ships less than 70 miles from us right now coming at max speed. However, we've got to fight this problem ourselves. We don't know what the size of the minefield is. And I'm not really excited about having two ships come in and have the same thing happen to them as happened to us. So we're going to have to hang in there like Sandra B. Roberts guys and fight this thing on our own. We're doing fine now. Keep charging. Keep your heads up. Anybody feels fatigued or feels down, make sure you report it to your on-scene leader so we can take care of you. Okay. The last thing is, it's getting dark. We need to maintain visibility. Clear the decks of any debris that might cause somebody to slip or fall and get hurt. Clean up the, uh, the missile hazards. And make sure we have a safe platform here to continue our damage control fight. That is all. So you can see that they'd already gotten they they gotten things more or less you know under control at a, through about five hours they managed to stamp out the fires you know get everything shored up get the flooding equalized uh, eventually they're taken under tow and they're towed into Dubai they're put up on blocks and and they kind of wait to to hear what the Navy wants to do with them in the meantime uh, the National Command Authority starts rigging for revenge. Now, at the time, the commander in charge of naval forces in the Persian Gulf was uh, Admiral Tony Less, who I know you, Ward, you know, you, you know Less. You served under him. Yes, I was his aide when he was airline. I've talked about him several times on the channel. Remind the viewers he was CEO of the Blue Angels when they transitioned from F-4s to A-4s, and they became an official squadron and not just a demonstration team. He was CEO of the Ranger, and then he was airland when he was a three-star. That's back when both coasts, west and east, were both three-stars. Now the air boss is the west coast guy and air land is a two-star. So he was nav sent. And, and what that means specifically is in those days, the way the Navy was organized fleet structure, there was no fifth fleet. There was only nav sent, Middle Eastern command, and he was subordinate to seventh fleet. Now, 7th Fleet stops at about, what, India, I think, um, and they're focused on China, where 5th Fleet is focused on the Persian Gulf and the North Arabian Sea and Suez and that sort of stuff. So the Navy was reorganized later, but in these days, Admiral Less, two-star, was the guy in charge in the area there. So National Command Authority comes back and says, all right, you know, start planning. And so Les puts together uh, a couple of options, but it becomes clear that uh, you know what what is desired is a proportional response. So, you know, the the minimal could be well, maybe we'll hit a couple of the oil platforms that the Revolutionary Guards, the Iranian paramilitaries, use for command and control. Uh, but that had been tried, you know, a couple months before um, an operation called um, Nimble Archer, and you know, it, it's maybe served a deterrent purpose, but not sufficient, it was deemed. Also, they they didn't want a plan to go attacking the Iranian, Iranian Navy at its home base. They didn't want to cross into Iranian airspace, Iranian waters. They wanted to keep it out in international waters. And so they settled on a plan uh, that would involve taking out two platforms and hunting one, exactly one Iranian warship. So just to go back a little bit, and the impetus, the final straw, if if you will, of this plan was making good on the, it's not quite a threat, let's call it a promise, that if they found more mines, if we found more mines and we could trace their lineage to Iran, then we were going to take military action. So when Sammy B was pulling into Dubai, an EOD team went out and recovered some of those mines and the serial numbers matched Iranian equipment. So that was the final straw for this planning uh, from the National Command Authority, as you said. So here we go. Operation Praying Manus. The basic construct are three surface action groups, SAGs, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. I don't know what happened to Alpha. And there was a battle group, Foxtrot, and that was the USS Enterprise. Another thing to point out at the outset, in these days, the Enterprise was in the northern part of the North Arabian Sea, kind of in the, it's starting to neck down a little bit towards the Strait of Hormuz, but not in the Gulf proper. That's right. So talk to us about the construct of these SAGs and their primary and secondary objectives. 
Uh, as you mentioned, you got uh, Surface Action Group Bravo, which consisted of uh, two destroyers and an amphib. You had the uh, the destroyer Lind McCormick, you had the destroyer Merrill, and you had the amphibious transport dock Trenton. And so they were ordered to go after two of the oil platforms that were being used by the Iranian paramilitaries. Um, there was also uh, Surface Action Group Charlie, which was the Wainwright, a cruiser, the Simpson, which was a, a frigate, um, same class as the Roberts, and Bagley, frigate of an older class. So you got these two groups. The SAG Charlie was also assigned an oil platform. And so the whole thing kicked off uh, about 8 a.m. with the uh, the launch of the Roberts Hilo, actually. The, the, the helicopter had been transferred from the Roberts when it went into Dubai, and it was operating from, from one of the, the SAGs in the Gulf. And it lifted off. Uh, and and SAG uh, Bravo approached the Sasan oil platform, and um, you know the, the the skipper had his his Farsi language radio communicator get on the horn and called over to the platform and said, "Look, you know, in five minutes I'm going to open fire." At that point, they saw two seagoing tugs that they used to ferry crews back and forth from mainland Iran to these oil platforms come aboard, and they don't know how many people got on them, but they, they went away. So the skipper, uh, the guy in charge of SAG Bravo, gave him another 20 minutes beyond the five minutes. They unloaded with their five-inch guns, but they had them set to airburst, uh, not to, to actually target the uh, platform. So when those airbursts went off, obviously somebody was left behind, a gunner, and he opened up with a ZSU-23, which is a Soviet AAA weapon, but obviously can be used against anything really. It's a very high-powered AAA gun. The rounds fell well short of the ships, but they're like, okay, game on. And they unloaded with, and these are the the two small boys, unloaded with their 5-inch 54s and basically just started taking out that gun emplacement. And immediately the Iranians came up that same common frequency and said, okay, cease fire. We want to get that last guy off. So this ocean going tug came back, got that last guy off and uh, they, they, they sailed away. Now they really start pounding the oil platform for 40 minutes. And at the same time, the Trenton launches a flight of two or three AH-1 Cobras and we have some FLIR footage of the Cobras firing tow missiles, anti-tank weapon, at what they believe to be the barracks compound, sort of the, you know, the, the square buildings on top of the platform. And as they're doing that, you can also see, if you look closely at that FLIR footage, that the five-inch rounds are still hitting. So they're basically taking it to uh, this, this platform. After that's done... The Trenton sends a couple of H-46s with with a ground element to the platform. They rappel down to the platform and they set a whole bunch of explosive charges to detonate some hours later. When those charges detonate, that platform is, is basically destroyed. So in the meantime, SAG Charlie is heading several miles away to take out the Siri platform. Uh, same deal. They pull up. The skipper radios a warning. You, know, you got five minutes before I intend to open fire. Evacuation takes place, uh, and then something unexpected happens. Like Marines landed on the Sasan platform, SEALs were supposed to land on Siri. And so they were you know, psyched to repel and put charges down and, and blow that thing up. Another flight of Cobras was doing just like they'd done on the previous platform, sort of trying to clear the way with 20 millimeter fire and tow missiles. But as they approached, another ZSU was directing fire in a way that they were afraid they were going to get hit. So they kind of beamed the platform and 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 exited the, the area for the time being. And at that point, SAG Charlie really unloaded with their five inch guns. And there must have been other munitions on the platform because the secondaries just basically did the SEALs job for them. They made the call that, okay, SEALs do not need to go aboard the platform. It's destroyed, which the SEALs were not very happy with, apparently. So that's that's what SAG Charlie did. Meanwhile, back to SAG Bravo, 
because now they're going for their secondary target and they had uh, a, a, a contact that they thought at first was Iranian, but they did the judicious thing and, and, and identified them. They get this radar contact and they launch a helicopter to go get eyes on whatever it is and turned out to be a Russian warship. And so they managed to raise them on the radio and they said, Russian warship, Russian warship, uh, <laughs> essentially, what are you doing? And the, the Russian guy says, I'm just here to take some photos, you know, for history. Okay, well, you know, we're, we're shooting things. So, you know, stay clear, please. I think overall, as we said, the tone was set that we're going to do kinetic stuff, but this is a proportional response, right? And so yeah. it wasn't a free for all. Had it been, you can imagine, had we launched a standard missile or a harpoon at a Russian warship, uh, that would have escalated, to put it mildly, in a, in a way beyond commander's intent. So smart move to sit on your hands, send your H-60 out there. I guess it was the Roberts H-60 to go check it out. He's like, hey, this is a Russian. And then talk to him. And they're like, like you said, you know, hey, we're just here to take the pictures for history, right? Yeah. So meanwhile... Meanwhile, right, Sag Charlie is continuing north after essentially destroying the Sir, the Siri oil platform, and it gets a uh, 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 ping on its radar. Um, and so this one turns out to be an Iranian warship. It turns out to be the Joshin, um, a sort of a, a small missile boat. I mean, it was it was small, but it was it was highly armed. It had you know at least one and possibly more. U.S. made harpoon missiles, the, you know, the surface to air, surface to surface missile that had been sold to the Shah before the Iranian revolution. It was another example of high tech U.S. weaponry that uh, that the U.S. found itself you know, facing off against. So uh, they hail Joshin. They, they say essentially, you know, uh, Joshin, Joshin, you know, you're, pro you're sailing into danger, wave off. And here's the thing, because they had been authorized to sink exactly one Iranian warship, they declined to immediately engage the Joshin. Uh, it was not the biggest, it was not the best ship that the Iranians had. They actually had two SAM class frigates, much more capable than the Joshin. That's what Tony Less and, and the rest of the naval forces really wanted to get. They hadn't spotted it so far today, and we're, we're talking midday now, we're talking maybe around noon. Uh, and so they were going to pass on the Joshin um, and, and see if the, the frigates, the SAM frigates, would come out to play. But they, kind of pushed their luck. The Joshin pushed their luck. So as you said, they're talking back and forth. The CEO of SAG Charlie is like, okay, say your intentions. And the, the Iranian CEO comes up and says somewhat cryptically, I intend to carry out my mission. So it's like, what does that mean? Is it, what's your mission? What? And so that seems a little bit uh, like a, a hostile intent kind of messaging. And then that guy goes Nordo. Further, that ship locks up the Wainwright, which is one of the ships, the small boys in Sag Charlie. And so now it's like, OK, um, you know, we've kind of met hostile intent here. Further, the Joseph sh fires a harpoon missile That's at right. Wainwright. So, OK, harpoon airborne, both Simpson and Wainwright fire a total of five standard missiles at this Joshin as the harpoon is coming at them. Simultaneously, they release chaff clouds. Again, this is a testament to good training. Four of the five standard missiles hit the Joshin, and the harpoon gets sucked off on the chaff, so it does no damage. Uh, so uh, good work there by SAG Charlie. Another member of SAG Charlie, the Bagley, fired a harpoon, mm -hmm. but it landed short. It didn't hit. So all the standard missiles hit. The harpoon did not hit. And yeah, so not, it's not the best day for the harpoon, I guess. No, no. Har harpoon was kind of a dated weapon by this time. We believe the Iranians of the number of harpoons they had was like maybe six. And they the one they shot was maybe the only one that would have gotten off the rail. At the same time, now the problem is getting more and more complicated. Uh, E2 picks up some F4s coming out of Bushir, an air base in Iran. And Sag Charlie is having none of it. Uh, you know, attempts to warn them off, the F-4s approach. And so uh, uh, Wainwright uh, fires a pair of standard missiles and uh, at least damages one of the F-4s, 
chases them off. They go, they return to base. Um, as far as I know, they both made it down. One of them was definitely damaged. Air threat neutralized, repelled. They finish off the Joshin with some more five inch gunfire. Now, meanwhile, back on the southeastern extreme end of the Persian Gulf, the Iranian Navy has put to sea. And the first things that the air group sees as they're monitoring is these bog hammers hauling ass westward. Right. And bog hammers are Scandinavian boats. Again, the part of the uh, the things that the West sold Shah era Iran, you know, good for what they are, you know, small and fast and, and you know, they pack a punch and they had sortied. And I should note, actually, that these were not Iranian Navy. These were, again, the Revolutionary Guards, the paramilitaries who were out there. And they start causing havoc. They attack um, a U.S. jack-up oil barge. Um, they attack uh, the Willie Tide, a U.S. flag support ship. And so, um, you know, so the, uh, the word is given to, to take them out. And so it's a SAG Bravo, Vectors U.S. aircraft over two A6s and a, and a 14. CAG-11 is the air wing aboard Enterprise. This is VA-95. The flight lead is a guy I served with later. At the time, he's a lieutenant commander. I served with him. He was the deputy CAG when I was CAG ops aboard George Washington. Jim Angler, a fantastic human being, just a great guy. Jim Angler is the flight lead. Uh, basically rolls in on these bog hammers, but he gets his tasking literally from the highest levels. Because the bog hammers, these small boats, weren't part of the overall plan. Uh, you know, the 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 pilots, the aviators call into you know their command, who calls into their command, who calls into Les, who sends it up the national up to the national command authority. It gets all the way to the Oval Office, and President Reagan says, "Yeah, go get them." And so back down the chain of command. And so it's weapons free on these bog hammers. Jim Engler and his wingmen and their BNs, remember A6, which we talked about in detail with the uh, Paco episode uh, very recently. So if you haven't seen that one, check it out. There's a lot of basics about the A6 intruder. But they roll in. Each one takes a separate bog hammer drop rock eye. So let's talk about Rock Eye real quick. Rock Eye, I think the nomenclature is CBU 20. Basically, it's a a casing that as you pickle it, it comes open and all of these bomblets come pouring out. It's an anti-personnel weapon. And the pattern, if you drop them at the proper altitude, is about the size of a football field. The Tomcat actually could drop rock eye. And I've dropped some uh, in training at Vieques back when we had the range there off of Puerto Rico. And it really does. You look down, when it goes off, it looks like it, the shape of a football field, a rectangle. So they drop some rock eye. Jim Anglers missed the bog hammer he was going after. His wingman had a direct hit on the other bog hammer. So one bog hammer neutralized the other, you know, was, was hauling ass back home at best speed. So that those two A6s now were gas critical. So they climb back up, hit the tanker, and await further tasking. So the, the plot will thicken. We're not done with Jim Angler at this point. Let me just correct something I, I said earlier, uh, Ward. I, I had said that it was the it was an American jack-up barge. It was actually Panamanian. And this is important because this is another reason why they had to go all the way up the chain of command. This was the first time that the U.S. Navy had intervened to stop an attack on a third-party uh, asset in the Gulf. So it was it was not an American that was being attacked uh, in this case. And so in order to get permission to do it, they went all the way up to the White House and back. And as we mentioned, SAG Bravo was headed for another oil platform, Rakesh. And MLS said, OK, let's call it off. He was not comfortable with the escalation. It was starting to get a bit nutty, right? F4s, we got bog hammers, we got... Uh, you know, these the neutral shipping is getting hit by these sort of berserkers that are manning these bog hammers going with really indiscriminately just whatever they came across, they were blasting away. And uh, and so all of these elements were kind of beyond what the planners had thought was going to happen. Like we said, they, we, we thought it would be sort of something we could do surgically hit a SAM class frigate their price ship and then call it proportional and then, then say, okay, that's it. But it's getting a little bit crazy. So Admiral Les is trying to de-escalate it. So he says, okay, don't hit Rakesh now. 
take a course southeast and let's look for these SAM class frigates. Meanwhile, the E2 and, and some of the other early warning indications pick up another SAM coming out of the port there in Iran. That's right, Bandar Abbas. This was finally at last the SAM class frigate Sahand. Uh, there were two of them in the Iranian Navy, and this one finally poked its nose out of port about 3 p.m. local time. So uh, it comes out, as you say, it got picked up, uh, and and it's heading out into the Gulf. And you know, this is a good time maybe to mention that one of the things that made Praying Mantis uh, a real um, a milestone in, in naval warfare is that it was the first time that the Navy had really tried out its networks. You know, it was the first big uh, operation where you had what we, you know, what we've come to think of as, as digital networks. It was you know, obviously a lot simpler and, you know, a lot more primitive back in those days, but you had actually data links going on. Uh, and this was the first time that they'd really tried it out. So uh, the the Sahan pokes its nose into the Persian Gulf. It heads south. It was picked up by SAG Delta. And uh, Delta phones into uh, to Admiral Less and said, okay, well, you know, here's here's that frigate we were talking about. We already sank one ship. Can we go after the frigate? Less radios back to Zag Delta, and he says, the Sahand is in your vicinity. Take him. The A7s that have been sitting on the flight deck in an alert status are champing at the bit. And so as Les gives that order, CAG launches those alert A7s with the express intent of supporting SAG Delta with whatever they need. Now, meanwhile, these A6s are up overhead on what we would call strike cap, Jim Angler, and also the deputy CAG, uh, Captain Bud Langston. Uh, so he's up there, and he's actually the closest guy to this uh, SAM class frigate. And he does like a midway, you know, dauntless profile, pushes through the scattered cloud layer and drops down to 50 feet. So he's headed for, and it, you know, his, his bombardier navigator is, is giving him the, the, the steering cues and everything. So they're doing what the A6 does best, which is come in low. In fact, they're so low that that SAM class frigate is trying to shoot them with their, their guns and can't train them low enough. So the rounds are going over the A6 as DCAG Langston flies overhead. And as they're headed outbound, still very low, this SAM class frigate, not to be confused with a SAM, fires two SAMs, SA-2s, and they they miss because he's dumping out chaff. So at this point, they've met the rules of engagement for a hostile act. So DCAG Langston is now going to climb back up and get ready to drop subordinates. He's now uh, fulfilled the, the requirement. He has visually ID'd the ship and he's been met by hostile action. The, the ship fired at him. And so he, he wings up, he attacks the ship, fires a, a harpoon at it. And while that harpoon's in the air, he gets a, que- a query from, uh, uh, from, I guess, the Enterprise who wants to know what his intentions are. And he says, well, I've, I, you know, my intention is to sink the ship. I've already fired a harpoon at it. And I'm just waiting for it to hit. And so he that does hit, and he follows up with some 500 pounders. One of those hits the bridge. He sees it, you know, take the bridge out. So he figures, okay, that ship is is neutralized, to put it mildly. So DCAG Langston, RTBs back to Enterprise. Meanwhile, another SAM class frigate is detected. That's right. And this this one is the Sabalan. And the Sabalan had a particular reputation in the Gulf. Its captain was known for well-nigh atrocities on the high seas. Some Iranians would allow you to get off your tanker before they sank it. The captain of the Sabalan was not known for, for such niceties. His nickname on the radio was Captain Nasty. So Captain Nasty's out in the Gulf, and it follows the A6s to go after him. The A6 in, in that we're talking about is is the two-ship that's led by Lieutenant Commander Jim Engler, who's who's now you know off the tanker and he's just waiting for uh, further tasking. So he winds up rolling in on Sabalan, staring down the fire coming at him, drops rock eye, 500 pounders, successfully neutralizes that second SAM class frigate. 
reportedly the, uh, the, the 500 pounder went straight down the stack and detonated in the engine room. For his actions with that attack, uh, Jim Engler was awarded later the, the Distinguished Flying Cross. Now, meanwhile, the first SAM class frigate, the Sahan, which is basically a Hulk at this point, is being engaged by another small boy. The USS Joseph Strauss launches another harpoon, which hits. And then these A-7s, who are super frustrated now because they sat on the deck for the first part of this, and then their tasking was basically stolen by DCAG. They were supposed to hit Sabalon. And, and so they're like, we're not going to land with this ordinance. So they kind of did a sink X uh, on Sahan and dropped a bunch of 500 pounders. And so that, that ship was basically riddled uh, by the entire strike package in various forms and SAG. Uh, by the time it was all over. Yep. If it wasn't going down before they, they managed to get their ordinance on it, it certainly was going down afterwards. And it, it did, in fact, go to the bottom of the Persian Gulf. And so the U.S. Navy had its its major combatant as far as you know the Iranian Navy had major combatants. It had sunk that. Um, and so the, the Sabalan, meanwhile, slightly to the north, was on fire. It was dead in the water. And uh, Admiral Crow, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, called it off, said, okay, that's it. You know, we've, we've shed enough blood today. Time to go home. So that's Finex for Operation Praying Mantis. I think the box score roughly is U.S. lost one Cobra. So that's two air crewmen killed. And I don't know how many Iranian sailors were killed, but basically we put half their Navy out of commission or at the bottom of the Persian Gulf. Yep, roughly speaking. So the epilogue uh, is sort of threefold. Right. So there are a couple of things, yeah, three things that came out of Operation Praying Mantis. Uh, It was, first of all, uh, groundbreaking in several ways from a a tactical point of view. I mentioned uh, the use of the networks that has become the American way of war. It was also the first U.S. missile duel between ships. uh, And I think the second in the world, I think there was uh, the Israelis had gotten into one some years earlier, but it was certainly the first time that the U.S. had had exchanged missiles with another naval with other naval assets. Um, It uh, it showed once again how a relatively unsophisticated uh, force can inflict grave damage on a more sophisticated force. I'm talking about the Roberts, a 1908 mine that probably cost a thousand bucks had put this, you know, hundred million dollar ship out of commission. Uh, You know, this is a lesson that, you know, we learn and relearn every time there's a fight. It's a lesson that the Russians are learning uh, in Ukraine. It's a lesson that, that, you know, our forces learned in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, you, you don't have, you can't make a force that's so sophisticated that it can't be hurt by, by a relatively unsophisticated enemy. So that's the tactical side. Uh, strategically, um, or, or geopolitically, it uh, very shortly brought to an end the, the Iran-Iraq war. This thing had ground on for almost eight years. It was, by some counts, the third deadliest war of the 20th century. It had been just horrific. Trench warfare, indiscriminate uh, killing of civilians by missiles in cities. Uh, and about a month after uh, the U.S. had this one-day war against the Iranian Navy, the Iran Iran essentially threw in a towel. It said, you know, we you know just can't do this. You know, if if other people are going to get involved, then then no mas. Uh, so there was a ceasefire and then an accepting of the UN brokered peace, and the war came to an end. You pointed out rightly that the asymmetric threat is something we got to think about when we talk about fifth generation this and next generation that. You can't ignore antiquated World War One mines and what they could do as you're doing all of the Gucci zoom waltz and, and the other things that we're into, the first question should be what happens if it hits a world war one era mine, right? What's the answer? So that's a lesson, but on the good side, these sags performed exactly as intended. This is your U S Navy on the cutting edge expeditionary warfare at its finest that compelled these two nations to stop fighting for one thing, but the tanker war ended. So that was the desired outcome and it did work. So you've got to say 
you know, bravo to the National Command Authority and the U.S. Navy for how they executed here. Yeah, it was a very, very complex operation, albeit one that was over in less than a day, but it, it certainly showed uh, how uh, advanced concepts of operations are, are meant to be put into action. And this is also pre-jointness. So there aren't any heavy tankers. There's no JFAC in Riyadh. This was the Navy as your sort of atom, you know, the elements and operating as a battle group and strike groups are supposed to operate. And this was very much a Cold War era and beyond kind of construct. We would train as a singular unit. And then in the later part of my career anyway, again, post Desert Storm, uh, you know, Goldwater Nichols and what were the other, or, you know, laws that made jointness a thing, uh, you would never do this kind of exercise, this kind of operation uh, by yourself. One service would not, you would have had strike eagles coming out of, uh, you know, gutter and uh, B2s out of Whiteman. I mean, you know, it would have been an all hands on deck, every service wants their piece of the action. Uh, so this was maybe the last sort of great Navy war at sea uh, kind of opportunity. And then we turn the page a few years later, and now we're doing Desert Storm, which the Navy had a huge part. At one time, we had seven carriers in the area, but they were working for the joint task force, uh, you know, and, and that that the idea of the admiral aboard the carrier is now in charge of anything uh, was greatly diminished. Yeah, very much on the cusp of, of an era, between one era and another, between you know, as, as you say, the last time the Navy really could could do a, a one day war by itself. So, Brad, thank you for bringing your expertise to bear. And we look forward to having you on again very soon. Great. Ward, thank you. All right. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, click the button and ring the bell so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to help support the channel, please click the super thanks, the heart icon below or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. In the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.